Etienne Charles is here, and we say good morning. Thank you for your presence. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. Good morning, DK. Now, you were here a little while ago with the San Jose Suite. How was that? Oh, the concert was great. We had a sold-out concert at Queens Hall, and um, and we played the San Jose Suite. That was the first time we played it in the Caribbean, so it was the Caribbean premiere. And we did a little bit of Christmas music. You know, it's a very moving piece for me because I did a lot of traveling to research that piece. And, yeah, it was inspiring to to finally, I mean, it, we the only thing we have to do to complete that triangle is to play the music in Costa Rica. We played it in California. We played it in Toronto. So now it's just to find a place to play it in Costa Rica. But it was, it was, it was a fascinating time here in Toronto. And I was really happy to see how the Trinidadian audience took to the music. Well, that's my question, because from the anthem, the anthem was done with a, with a touch that was a little, a little different. Mm-hmm. Um, so wh- what did the audience actually give to you after? What can we... Uh, people had, people had a lot, there was a lot of positive feedback, I would say, um, from the suite alone, even, you know, not even talking about the Christmas music that we did after that, but just the suite alone. People, people were, were grateful that, that I was able to take some of our experiences and our stories and put them to music, to, you know, to, to tell the story in a different way, as opposed to somebody just talking about it, to hear music to color it. So that was, that's why we did it. So in terms of having music that based in, in essence is basically a soundtrack of our lives and our existence, what, what is the significance of that, especially for the purpose of telling stories, recording history? Um, I think it's, it's important because art always has to tell a story, right? And, um, and having, having history and, and social relevance is very important. If you look at Calypso, if you, could, if you listen to Calypsos from the last 80 years, you, you just listening to the Calypsos, you learn the history of Trinidad and Tobago. You know, you learn about when World War II was happening. You could learn about when the Federation fell through. You could learn about all types of aspects of our history just from listening to the Calypsos because the Calypsonian tells the story. So we try, I try to do that with my music without, what well, one with, is without lyrics. So it's really about the colors and harmonic, harmonic contours, shapes of the melodies and the way that I use rhythm to, to either drive people one way, drive people another way. And so that's, that's how we, that's how we're able to tell the story and put it in context. What kind of research you spoke? You said there's a lot of research that went into it. What does that research entail? Um, well, with, with the sound of this week and with this carnival project, a lot of the research involved meeting with people and um, doing field, field recordings and videos. Um, and so, so with, like what I'm doing now for the carnival show, um, I went all over Trinidad and recorded like the boy drummers. I recorded um, Tambo Bambo. I recorded. Um, the the devils the jab jabs the whip jab jabs the blue devils the jab malassi as they're called um and really synthesized their sound so took in the, their tradition learned how they play learned the rhythms learned the history of their rhythms and then i'm able to take that and put like hair baseline to go under it hair melody to go over it and then hair harmony to connect the two and so um, that's my concept. That's how I do research. But also, it's, for me, it's important to 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 really meet with the people, and and sit with them because that's a lot of what the music reflects. Is it reflects the people, and it's about the energy. It, you know, you could think about it just about the music, but music is made by people, and music is made by people to reflect people. And so, for me, it's most important to know and know everybody, know their names, know where they're from, know you know, find out that they might be my cousin, things like that. And that's that's what made the music powerful. Do you think we sometimes suffer from an embarrassment of riches? And I say that with regard to, specifically with regard to the music. Um, Trinidad is, is you know, it's funny because, you know, you, you, it's a case of you don't know what you have until, you know, not that you don't know what to have until it's gone, but it's, when you have so much, it's hard to be able to focus on it. And so that's why I undertook this project, because I wanted to be able to present a piece that showed the world, in addition to Toronto and Tobago, but showed the world what we have here in Carnival. What we have here is a multifaceted cultural spectrum. You know, it's very diverse from, you know, it's theatrical, it's musical, it's dance, it's visual art, it's improvisation, 
all in one. It's historical reference. It's social commentary. It's satire. You know, it's parody. It's all of these things all under one word, and that one word is carnival. You know, it, all. But you don't think if when you, you when you think about carnival on a regular basis, you don't think about it as all of these things. It's food. You know, it's fashion. It's style. It's language art. When you think about the black Indian speaking speaking a black Indian hybrid language, or you know the Damlorian speaking Creole, when there's, that's a language art. There's spoken word. There's improvisation. There's you know, and, and the, you know, there's mass arrangements in music. You know, between the steel bands and and the calypso competition, um, and the Chutney soccer competition. So it's all these things put into you know, it's a big mess, a huge part, and that's the beauty of carnival. And part of the reason I asked that question is I'm wondering whether or not you're able to see it clearer because you are a little removed physically. Not, not, not in terms of the uh, the way that you're thinking about it, but removed physically and exposed to other things. To saying that, okay, well, we have this here. Yeah, I mean, I guess living abroad helps. I mean, you know, they say you know you don't really know your home until you leave and miss it and understand, and then because then you see it from you can see it. You might be able to see it from an outsider's perspective. You might, but you will be able to see from the outside compared to the outside how special what you have on the inside and so you know and and Trinidad is a very free place you know the freedom that carnival exudes you know the fact that we can do what we want you know you know you know I always tell people that you know in carnival time you see men dressed like women you see women dressed like men you know there's one time a year where people get to is the question is do people is it at one time a year that people get to be themselves or do they have? Do they get to be somebody else? You know, that's the question. Or, or who are we as a people on a day-to-day basis? And I think Carnival really brings out who we are, um, culturally speaking. And yeah, leaving Trinidad helped me to really understand what this massive Carnival was. That I could then come back and really do detailed study of each each tradition, each character. And really get into the fold of what made each thing happen and then learn how it relates to history so that I'm properly informed to then go and write music about it. How do you decide, okay, I'm going to combine this in this way? Because you spoke about having interviews with the people to realize what was going on behind them to the story that went into the music. Uh, In terms of combining saying, okay, well, this goes with this, and that's the way I see it. How do you do that? So, um, so let's say, like, take, take, for example, the Tambu Bamboo, right? So, with the Tambu Bamboo, um, the Tambu Bamboo came out of the, the banning of the, the African drums, right? So, when the British banned drumming, I think it was in 1884, that it was, I mean, they banned African drumming in the Caribbean many times. The French banned it a long time, the 18th century. But then the British banned it in the in the eighteen hundreds in in the nineteen century eighteen eighty four, and so Tambu Bamboo came out of that experience. So is that creativity of okay not being able to do one thing, but then having to move to the other thing? That's what create. I re- wrote a piece about that. It's called Black Echo, and it's about the movement from okay, well we can't play drums anymore. And this is our mode of communication. This is our main mode of expression musically. What do we do now to communicate? And so that's how so that comes so so that piece comes out of a dark place. Because it comes out of not being able to it's come like you're silenced. So it starts out with a dark mood and then harmonically I can create a dark mood. And but I'll layer it on a rhythm because that's the underlying idea. And then from there my goal is to let the sun rise eventually because well we have hope we still you know it's a you know carnival is the the celebration of hope you know it's a celebration of freedom but it's without hope without hope you can't have freedom and so it's a celebration of all that so we try to put that into the piece and then it becomes the tambu bamboo who do you try to be faithful to when i ask that question is it the person's story you're telling is it the Air of the listener, or is it yourself? Um, I think most importantly, my most important mandate is to the music, and what that means is, what does music do? For me, music reflects. Right. 
So for me, the music it has to reflect the actual story and reflect the people. So my mandate is to create, through my palette, a sound that tells that story and does honor to the person who either I learned that story from or this person who that story is about. And so with audiences, um, I'm very honest with the audience and a lot of times they appreciate the music because it comes from the story. And so and, and there are ways to 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 make sure that you I mean you can't please everybody, but there are ways that you can musically go certain places to make sure that people get the story and they get the point. And so but yeah, my mandate is to, to, to the music from the meaning that that music has to tell the story. Some people think music has to just make people feel good and bounce and get on, which, yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, and sometimes I think that way too, but with, with like a project like this, it was about making sure that the actual imagery gets portrayed. It seems as though you have a sense of responsibility with it. Exactly. That's the goal is to, you know, we, we have to, somebody has to take ownership and show that that this is carnival is a, a a masterpiece in real time right and it has been a masterpiece for more than 100 years you know what i'm saying it's a living masterpiece it's a living dynamic moving changing masterpiece that's that that's vast you talk about how many people on the road, you know what I'm saying? You talk about how many devils come down through pyramid. You know, there's a mass, mass masterpiece happening. And somebody needs to be able to tell that story. In terms of research, how long did it take you to actually do the research till it got to a point when they say, yes, I'm ready to actually go into the lab and actually make music? Um, me? I started reading up on the carnival stuff. The first thing that really piqued my interest was the devil mass. And I remember around maybe 2011 or 12, I started reading all these different articles and chapters from books, just specifically about the devils. Like I read Errol Hill's book, and the Errol Hill book um, has a chapter on the devils. I read Jeff Henry's book, Under the Mask. I had stuff on, on the, um, the devils and um, all these different other books. There's a book that just came out called Fest Festive Devils of the Americas. And it, it shows that all these different cultures in the New World that have this Diablo or the devil. Um, and then from there... I was like, okay, and then I started doing more research, and then when I wrote, the, I wrote a, I wrote a grant, I wrote a fellowship proposal to the Guggenheim Foundation, and they, they, I won the fellowship, and that gave me the resources to be able to one take time off of teaching at Michigan State University and come down to Trinidad and spend, um, you know, eleven weeks here, just taking in the ritual, the people, all of it. And meeting with them and recording them and seeing how it works so that I can then extract musical ideas from it to compose my piece. So then I didn't really start writing the piece. I started writing the piece. I started writing the thing in maybe 2015, 2014. 2015 I started writing it. And then, um, and yes, yeah, still going. Because it's, it's never going to end because it's the carnival that will never end. Is there anything that you learned during the process that really surprised you? Um, I think more than anything else, it taught me that you really have to educate people. Um, because you know, there's this whole you would talk about it on on the TV show earlier about about this whole rhetoric of Calypso dying, you know, and it's just that it's a rhetoric because it's not true, you know. Um, and I and it's the same thing about about our carnival, our culture, you know. You know, people talk about oh, and the, the culture is dying, and and the people who say that they they're not in tune with what actually is going on. You know, they they haven't been to Pyramid on Carnival Monday or for Juve. They haven't been to Gasparillo. They haven't been to Moruga to see the bar. You know, they haven't been to Londonville on a Saturday night or Friday night during any time in January to see some stick playing. You know, um, and so. If it's not in sight, it's out of mind. And so we have to put it in sight of as many people as possible, as much as possible, to make sure everybody knows. So that, that, for me, that was the most important thing to learn, is that, that we are fine. 
Like our culture is fine. Our culture is growing. It's dynamic. You know, people are evolving. People are are are, are innovating on our pre-existing traditions musically, culturally, and um and we just have to let we have to figure out a way to make sure that as many people in the world know about that. That's where education comes into play. And so we have to just let people know. Let's put it out. Put the word out there that that this is what we have and this is this is alive and well. And what role does context play? Let me and let me give you a context to that question. The fact that you weave the stories through the performances in the larger in the larger scheme of a concert, um, I think is so important uh, because there's some things that are understood by the practitioners in one context, and but people who are consuming that by YouTube or by some social media, they don't get that context. They don't get that education. Yeah, so so you know then context is very important and um if you can always try to put context into what you do because because what it does is it maximizes comprehension and it minimizes confusion because confusion leads to turning away from it because you know if you don't know what something is most people will leave it alone. Some people are curious and will go digging and be like, oh, you know, so so you would tell me that you listened to, to my record and you heard my sax player, Jacques, and got into his music um, through that, right? But that's the context that you heard. So the context that you heard Jacques, Jacques, you discovered Jacques was through my either my album, Folklore, Creole Soul, whichever one. But I'll put it in a different context, is that I learned about Jacques playing from his record, Sonny Kala and Abyss, and then hired him. And then we did Folklore and Creole Soul because I was like, wow, you know, he's doing this with Guadalupian music, and that's exactly what I want to do with Trinidad and Tobago folk music. Wow, so it's like it's almost like a marriage in a sense. And so, so, but with context, same thing with a song. So a song might sound happy to you, but if you don't know the context of the song, you miss it. And so, giving that context is essential. You know, we could talk about Full Extreme, you know, which is, a, which is you know, probably the hottest song on the airwaves right now. And if you put it in context, the song is a beast. If you take it out of context, it's a happy song. But you put it into context, and it's a mirror of our society at the status quo, like right now. This is who we are. You know, what's funny is that somebody was called. Somebody called in and said that song is so unpatriotic. You know, they say they play Bandung and and y'all play this on the radio. And I was sharing that in terms of one saying, okay, well, in spite of these circumstances, these challenges, we're moving on. And how do we deal with that? We do it in a way where we get that aggression, we focus it, and we put it on the street or something like that. Or and there's there's another song by Gazette, another local band, and they said this is the dance we do from night into morning, and it can only done when we see the sun. And it talks about Jumbi following you and how it is you move and use the rhythm as a tool, and it, it as opposed to this art or music, you turn it into technology as a, an instrument to actually deal with these energies as opposed to being consumed by them. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right, and, and I think that's. I was telling Devon Seal earlier. You know, I, said, I just thought I was giving him some words of encouragement. I said, "Look, keep doing what you are doing. The Kaisonians' role in society is to educate the people. The Kaisonians' role in society is to keep politicians on their toes, and that's that's the that's throughout the history. The Kaisonians' role. I mean, Kaiso, Kaiso is originally, you know, some people call it editorial in the song. I think." Um, I think the Growling Tiger called it the poor man's newspaper. Um, the Growling Tiger also called it an editorial in the song. And it's really, a, the Kaisonian's role is to, to, to shine light on things as they are. Not as they should be, but as they are. Has that role, has that role changed over time? Um, I think that over time, um, the, the Kaisonian as an entertainer, I think the Kaisonian, the, the 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 tracks have kind of split. 
So you could either go down to entertain one track, or you could go down to enlightenment and educate and track. And um, funny enough, what Maximus is, the, I mean, MX Prime, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Edgel. <laughs> um, I remember when he was Edgel Thomas, actually. Um, but um, what MX has done is he's actually putting the two tracks back together, which is what is needed. You know, cause we, you know, the, the the split between Soka and Kaiso needs to come closer together again, and so and we and so yeah, we 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 still have some serious Kaisonians out there that are stinging people. They, they I mean, every year listen listen to Dimash Gras. That's just the finals, you know. You talk about Skinner Park, you talk about more people, and you talk about the tens. There's numerous tunes. And do they get on the airwaves? Some of them do, some of them don't. But luckily, we have things like, you know, there are things like YouTube that, that give people a chance to be heard. And so I think the Kaiso Union is still doing their job. And if we could figure out ways for Kaiso to get more in the mainstream so that people, because the role of a Calypso is to educate the people so that we can get it more into the mainstream. The same way we can, if we could get more of the, the carnival into the mainstream. That's why the, that's why I'm doing this concert. So the concert is this Sunday. And where is it? It's at Queens Hall Sunday, January 29th, 6 p.m. Um, tickets are $300, and they're available at Queens Hall's box office. They're available at Rapworks Deli in Woodbrook. They're available at the Haganas stores, Haganas locations in Gulf City in San Fernando. Shops at Trin City and um, the Falls at West Mall. And you can also call our ticket hotline, which is 682-1070. Who are some of the people who have actually helped with this with, with this premiere? Oh, my gosh, so many. We've had some great sponsors. We had Calabash Foundation for the Arts as our presenting sponsor. Um, we've also had... Um, Caribbean Airlines came on, came 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 like a night in night in shining armor. Um, Caribbean Airlines and the Hilton Hotel, um, also Quality Consultants Limited, um, Massey Foundation is helping out with with an educational initiative that we have, um, and yeah, they, 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 yeah, these things are impossible without sponsors and then without people. So our crew, you know, Maria Noons, who was my line producer for for the project, of, you know, in terms of organizing video and meeting with people. Um, Robin Foster, who was the audio engineer for the whole project, um, recorded we, when we did all the recordings and turned that. And then, you know, the whole crew at Queens Hall and then my crew, the stage manager, um, Bebo, Lamar Pollard. Um, it's a whole mass team. Wendell Man Warren is our artistic consultant. My sister Abby Charles is the movement director. And then my band is flying in. John Davis on drums. Lucas Curtis on bass. Um, Christian Sands on piano. Godwin Louis on alto saxophone. Alex Wentz on guitar. Plus, you know, the Claxton Bay Tambu Bamboo. Um, the original Jab Jabs. Um, Earl Rodney Steel Plan. Um, 2001 Jab Malasi Blue Devils uh, from Paramin. Um, the the Black Indian Andy Patrick. The um, the, ooh, the Moko Jumbies, Touch the Sky Moko Jumbies. Um, who else is it? I mean, it's such a vast <laughs> project. There's so many people. Um, folk drummers, Red Man, Watson, Lion, Osuna, and um, Coyote Charles. Um, it's just this whole world of, of groups, you know. And so... But yeah, I also saw some other people. And does is Culture Shock Music in, involved with it? Culture Shock Music is one of the, the main presenting sponsors as well, um, and that's that's an independent record label based in the U.S. that that focuses on roots music and indigenous music, and and um, it's the record label that my albums are on, and um, so we put we put a lot into it. Just before. Just before we wrap up, the transformative aspect of this type of music, and I say that because people talk about globalization and there's this kind of homogenization that's going on, but at the same time, people want different, they, but they want something that resonates with them. It seems so magical to me from the time I rubbed this paint on myself. I'm someone different. I'm transformed. I'm no longer the same. And... I could be working a nine to five under pressure, this that that, but in that blue paint, I'm Superman. Or oh, Superman wish he was me. 
You know, what you just said to me is the essence of carnival. And I think Maria said it best. She said, carnival is a time when you can see people go from ordinary to extraordinary. And that's all it is. Somebody who's a cleaner or some like, well, you, then you see them. They might be the baddest stick fighter. Somebody who's a lawyer might be the meanest um, bar drummer. You know what I'm saying? Somebody who's an electrician might be the meanest black Indian. You know what I'm saying? And and they go from their, their day-to-day jobs, right? Regular work. And then they put this costume on or this paint hits their skin. And, you know, you see it with the jabs because as, so they start off clean, of course. And then by the time a little bit of paint is on their skin, they start acting a different way. And then by the time up to their neck is covered in it, they're doing so, they're moving. And then, and then finally, the paint goes on their head, and their whole body's blue. And that's when the screams start coming on, that's when the balls start, and that's it. That's the devil, you know. And so to see that transformation was what I was here for. And that the transformation is what the music is. And we want to thank you for sharing that experience with us, Etienne Charles. It is on this Sunday, and it's one night only. But we want to thank you for sharing some insight about it. Actually, you've moved me to play something dealing with that transformative aspect, Smokey Joe by Andre Tanker. So we do that Ooh, when we come back. Nice. <laughs> Talk City 91.1 FM. Perfect.